China are enormously important and I think China's growth and continued growth, even though it's been slower, has been an important bedrock for the way the rest of the region has performed. The stimulus announcements which have been coming out and they've been moving all the time suggest that we're now at a scale of stimulus which can have some impact on the way the Chinese economy performs over the next quarter or two and then continuing the structural reform, hopefully those two married together can sustain growth uh, at good rates well into 2025. So I think the market's idea that the Fed will keep easing very consistently all the way through to the end of next year, I think that's probably too aggressive. I think the Fed will go much more uh, slowly and you know, sporadically than that. 4.8% China's GDP showed a stable performance in the first nine months of 2024, despite the complicated external environment and the emerging challenges at home. As more monetary and physical measures are unveiled, China's economy will maintain the upward growth momentum. How will China's economy perform in the first quarter? At the same time, how will the phase easing cycle impact the global economy? What are the main challenges? Richard Isinger, ANZ Group Chief Economist, is joining our show. Hello, Richard. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Let's begin with global monetary policy. Some major central banks have cut rates in recent months. Will it be a global trend? I think it will be a global trend. It's good news. The interest rate that central banks increased to through 2022 and 2023, which got inflation to peak and then decline, that can't be the interest rate that central banks need to maintain inflation at target. So we will get some interest rate cuts. With The Fed has obviously eased in the US, New Zealand, uh, UK, a range of other economies have already started easing. I think the Easing cycle, though, will look very different from the tightening cycle. Central banks were running to catch up through the tightening cycle. So when they started to move, they moved very aggressively and very consistently. And all the central banks move very much together. But the easing cycle will be very much dependent on local conditions. And interest rates won't go all the way back to where they were in 2021 at the beginning of the tightening cycle. So already this year, Fed has moved by 50, New Zealand has moved by 50, Europe has moved by 25, the UK has moved by 25, and some have moved and had a gap in between each of their moves. I think the interest rate cycle, easing cycle, will look a lot more like this very decorrelated, much more staggered, much more driven by local conditions. But lower interest rates into uh, 2025 is good news for the global economy. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Fed, its decision in September church debate, do you think its action is too aggressive? I think a little bit. I was surprised the Fed eased uh, in September by 50 basis points. I, it, it didn't seem consistent with the data I was looking at and it didn't seem consistent with the signals that we'd had uh, from the Fed. And in fact, the data that has come out after the Fed cut by 50 basis points seems to suggest maybe they were a little bit too hasty. Let's also remember the, the history for this December last year. So nearly one year ago, uh, Chair Powell, the chair of the Fed, suggested that the Fed would soon be easing and it took um, nine months for the Fed to ease. So I don't know that they've had a full grasp on the nature of this cycle. I think they have expected the US economy to be weaker inflation to decline more quickly and so they'd be able to ease uh, more quickly. The market has also become less comfortable with the idea the Fed will ease every meeting and the risk of the Fed skipping one meeting, easing, pause, easing, uh, I think is going up. Do you think the US inflation has achieved the Fed's goal in September? No, it hasn't. The Fed targets inflation as measured by the uh, private consumption deflator. Most people look at the consumer price index, the CPI. The CPI is still around 2.5% on the core measure. The private consumption measure is closer to 2 but on the, on the most inflation measures, inflation still has some room to decline. And the challenge for the Fed at the moment is the current numbers we're getting for the US economy suggest growth remains quite strong in the US. We probably need growth to slow a bit further, so inflation can decline a bit further. 
for the Fed to achieve its target. So I think the market's idea that the Fed will keep easing very consistently all the way through to the end of next year, I think that's probably too aggressive. I think the Fed will go much more uh, slowly and you know, sporadically than that. Mm -hmm. We know the next FOMC meeting will take place after the U.S. election. How will the election result influence the Fed's decision? Well, the Fed has to focus on the economy and the economic cycle, not the political cycle, of course. But if there's an election where the two candidates have very different policy positions and where the economy might be different depending on the outcome, the Fed, of course, needs to think about that in its risk management. Remember, in the US, the presidential election is November. The new uh, president doesn't take office until January. And then even then, it will take some time to implement their policies. So the Fed has time. I think for the Fed's next meeting, the election will not be a feature. But certainly in the Fed's forecasts, and as we get through the election, the Fed will have to take more account of the different policy positions. And for the Fed, I think the main policy differences between the candidates around tariffs and trade and also around fiscal policy. Both candidates uh, are talking about the budget deficit getting larger, which I think most people outside the US wonder if that is wise. Vice President Harris's plans embody a smaller increase in the budget deficit um, than presidential candidates Trump's plans, according to the Congressional Budget uh, Office. And so for the Fed, I think a change from a Democratic president to a Republican president would have a bigger impact on their forecasts, certainly for 2025 and 2026. Mm -hmm. Will the budget deficit be a crisis for next president? I don't think crisis is the right word. I'm alert and watchful rather than alarmed about the US budget deficit and the US fiscal position. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office says for the next decade, based on current policy, the US budget deficit might be 6% of GDP a year. I think it's too big. I think it's likely to be sustained at levels which are too big. And US debt, uh, government debt is already 130% of GDP. So the numbers don't look good and the lack of agreement over fiscal policy is not, uh, is not constructive. But also the US tax revenue is very, very low. US tax revenue is only around 20% of GDP. So if there's a fiscal kind of problem, uh, the US has ability to tax more to help solve the problem. Politics doesn't look like it's close to agreeing on <laughs> higher taxation, but I think a long time before we get to a genuine fiscal crisis, we'll find there'll be support for more taxation in the US. Mm -hmm. So are you confident with the US economy? I don't know that confident is the right term. I, I think the US economy's main issues are supply side rather than demand side. That's a good problem in a way. The, the harder problem is when the, the main issue is demand side. But for the US, uh, growth remains strong. There's a strong desire to uh, produce more electronics in the US strong desire to produce more elements of the climate transition in the US, strong desire to push ahead with the climate transition. Household balance sheets remain in very strong shape. So consumption has been uh, quite good, strong desire to build more homes in the US. All of those things are adding to a, a strong pipeline of work, but it's accessing the resources to, to deliver that work and also bring inflation back to target, which is really the policy challenge uh, in the US. It's a better policy challenge than the opposite challenge, which is a deep and nasty recession where demand side is the big problem. But I think certainly if you look at the, the state of the uh, political debate and the economy in the US, that supply side problem is causing, is causing some issues. And the US is not alone in many of those challenges. Many economies uh, would like to produce more uh, domestically would like to produce more housing, would like to go faster on the climate transition, would like strong uh, consumption and household spending. It's difficult to have all of those things at the same time. And I think those supply side challenges will limit how much interest rates can come down. As I say, that's a real policy challenge, but better than the other challenge, which is uh, a big demand side challenge. Mm -hmm. I want to ask more about the Fed. How many times will Fed cut rates and how many basis points will they cut in this easing cycle? Yes. 
So the, the tightening cycle was a, about 500 basis points, about 5%. We think the easing cycle in total will be about 200. So a bit less than half of the tightening cycle. The Fed's already moved by 50 basis points. That means 150 basis points to go. I think more likely we will have a mix of 25 basis point moves and then pauses at some meetings. The Fed's moved by 50. I think that's probably the exception. I think now we will have a more gradual, modest, slower easing cycle than we've seen to date. And that the 200 is about half of the 500 tightening. I think in rough terms, that's the way probably we should think about the easing cycle. We don't, interest rates are not going back all the way to where they were uh, in 2020 and 2021, but still a 3% or 3.5% interest rate in the US economy will be, uh, will be much better than 5.5%. So it will be a relative high rate in the US. Right? I think so, yes. And the US is not alone. Australia, New Zealand, the UK, uh, Korea, most economies uh, coming out of the pandemic, I think will end up with interest rates at higher levels than before the pandemic. A few reasons for that. I, I spoke about uh, supply side challenges, I think they apply everywhere. If we look at the advanced economy, so the OECD, the working age population has started to decline over the past five to 10 years. Uh, that's only the second time that's happened in 150 years. So more domestic production, more consumption, more houses, more infrastructure, uh, but working age population uh, as a share of the total declining. That's why that supply side challenge exists, um, I think, and one of the reasons interest rates will be, uh, will be higher for longer. Mm -hmm. In the past months, how has the, the rate cuts affected other markets, especially emerging markets? Well, I think the backdrop for emerging markets has been very good. The Fed raised rates by 500 basis points, and in large part, emerging markets handled that in very good shape. Remember 10 years ago when the Fed was raising interest rates, there were substantial financial problems, particularly in Asia. You'll recall the, the fragile five economies, including Indonesia and India. There were no fragile five this time. And in fact, there were no fragile economies in Asia at all. And that largely reflects the fact Asian fundamentals are much stronger. The, the economies which traditionally have had big trade deficits, India and Indonesia, have had uh, much improvement along that. And domestically in Asia, uh, certainly in the smaller economies, financial fragilities have been much improved, uh, less hot money into the region, banking systems in much firmer shape, uh, domestic credit growth was not as strong as 10 years ago. So Fed easing has unquestionably helped Asia, helped cement the economic cycle uh, the US dollar's been a bit weaker, Asian currency stronger. But the better news is in the tightening cycle, Asia was quite resilient. Mm -hmm. China is a very important part for the emerging market. So how do you think about China's performance in the past three quarters? Oh, China is about half of Asian GDP, enormously important. Um, second largest economy in the world. And, and sometimes I don't know that everybody remembers the scale. China is about an 18 trillion US dollar economy. So China enormously important. And I think China's growth and continued growth, even though it's been slower, has been an important bedrock for the way the rest of the region has performed. Do you think foreign companies still want to invest in China? Unquestionably, second largest economy in the world, largest trading nation. Uh, most companies are still looking for efficiencies with supply side and cost pressure continuing to grow. But I think companies are looking elsewhere to diversify their footprint given the nature of the global economic cycle. And the fact the global economy as a whole over previous decades had, has continued to slow down. It's very healthy today, growing at a solid rate, but it has continued to slow down. And so I, I think companies are always looking um, for the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. Did you have any takeaways from China's third plenary session? I think the third plenum, the impression I was left with is a very strong support for the existing policy approach and the existing uh, policy stance and continuing to move incrementally on structural uh, reform. Uh, I think as economies go through transitions, the requirement for reform uh, 
grows over time. And the third plenum, I think, emphasised the, the track that China is on from a structural perspective, continuing to open up, continuing to try and emphasise um, and energise the new productive forces. And of course, sitting outside China, you can't help but see the success in a number of sectors, electric vehicles, uh, solar batteries, really that push into the climate transition. China has made incredible inroads, and I think the third plenum is continuing to push in that direction. Mm -hmm. How do you understand the new quality productive forces? So I think for China, it's shifting beyond uh, manufacturing as might have suited China through a certain stage of development, and now shif shifting into areas growth of growth with their, which are higher productivity and higher technology. Mm -hmm. Mass manufacturing, China will always be strong at because of its scale and size, but also as you develop economically, that becomes a competition for price, and for not all of those sectors will, will continue to sustain themselves in China as China continues to develop. Because of course, economic development goes hand in hand with higher costs of production, and so releasing some of that production to other economies while China continues to invest in new productive forces will ensure China continues to develop and grow its standard of living. Like you mentioned, China is on the way to high quality development. So what industries will be the main force for China's economy in the future? Well, to, to achieve high quality development and to move through the upper middle income phase into the advanced economy phase, private consumption in China must develop and service sectors uh, must develop. As economies uh, grow, uh, and become wealthier, they'll naturally release mass production, I think, to other economies. So consumption in China is about half of GDP. So to sustain GDP growth at perhaps 5% in real terms, China needs to grow private consumption as, at above 5%. There are some challenges around that, particularly because of the now decline in the population in China, which is likely uh, to continue. So reform in private consumption, I think, is just as important as reform in the industrial economy in China. Mm -hmm. You know China unveiled the new physical and monetary measures in recent weeks. So how will these new measures boost economic growth? Well, the, the, the offshore community is looking for the magic 10 trillion renminbi package. Uh, and maybe to put that in some scale, in 2008 and 2009, in today's terms, the stimulus then was worth maybe 11 trillion renminbi. So 10 trillion is, is big. Uh, and the economy today is about 125 trillion renminbi. So 10 trillion is maybe 7.5% of GDP, which is very substantial. But the difference between this stimulus and the 2008 stimulus is the, the target and the time frame. 2008 was very demand driven to stimulate activity. The stimulus today is designed to help clean up, more designed to help clean up balance sheets, help local governments, help banks, and ultimately then stimulate growth through the secondary measure. Also, today's, the, the previous stimulus was delivered quite uh, aggressively and had a big impact on China's economy and the world economy. This stimulus is likely to be stretched out over as much as three years. So there will be some growth impact, and the financial markets obviously have, have been trying to include that in the way they assess uh, the, the level of financial asset prices. But the bigger impact, I think, will be on China's ability to sustain growth over time. Do you expect more stimulus? I think we need to treat stimulus as something which responds to the environment. And already over recent months, as the economy continued to slow, the stimulus responded to the economy. Um, so I, I suspect that China would like to sustain growth close to 5%. And this year will be close to 5%. And so the stimulus will continue to be delivered, I think, un until we find that uh, growth has stabilized um, around that level. Uh, falling population and high debt will involve some need for reform and stimulus in China. So it's good to see that we're starting to get that through uh, uh, more promptly. Mm -hmm. What should the policymakers do to achieve its 5% growth goal? Well, the, the plenum emphasised the role of structural reform, which should be continued to be pushed through. Um, stimulus without reform will stimulate growth, but then growth will go back to the previous baseline. Uh, 
but it's the combination of the two, I think, which will give some real uh, vigor to the Chinese economy as we go into 2025. The stimulus announcements which have been coming out and they've been moving all the time suggest that we're now at a scale of stimulus which can have some impact on the way the Chinese economy performs over the next quarter or two and then continuing the structural reform, hopefully those two married together can sustain growth uh, at good rates well into 2025. Mm-hmm. How about the global economy? What are the main challenges? A lot of people still ask me about global recession and the risk of global recession. Through this tightening cycle, I think the risk of global recession has been quite low, at least in my assessment. Our experience with deep uh, damaging recessions is they need some financial trigger. And actually, for most of the world, financial systems are in better shape than they've been for more than 15 years. Balance sheets, private sector balance sheets are in better shape for more than 15 uh, years. And they're the things which I think have typically caused problems uh, in the global economy and triggered uh, deep and damaging downturns. I think the main issues in the global economy are supply side. Uh, Aging populations, falling share of uh, working age individuals in the population, big climate transition agenda, a big housing construction agenda as housing affordability becomes a bigger issue in more economies. It's how to deliver into those things uh, with limited resources, I think, is the main challenge for the global economy, not the risk of a deep and damaging recession. Which region will drive the global growth? Uh, Which region will... Look, Asia is the strongest region from a global... from a growth uh, perspective. Most of the world has slowed down over the last few decades. Um, The two big economies that haven't slowed down are the US and India. India, of course, is the cornerstone for South Asia, and India is much smaller than the US and certainly much smaller than China, but it's been growing quite well and I think is charting its own course as it's developed. India is still a developing economy. GDP per capita is about two and a half thousand US dollars, and the economy overall is nearly four trillion US dollars. So similar in size to Japan and Germany, But I think over the next 10 years, India will probably go through a development phase which takes it into uh, the middle income economy. And that will mean also it becomes a bigger and more important participant in global trade and supply chains. And so while in the last few decades, North Asia was sustained first by Japan and Korea and then uh, by China, and that filtered through to the rest of Asia, now I think you're seeing some influence from South Asia as India starts to come on. But I can assure you, when I travel to uh, other parts of the world, investors and businesses with a global view still look at the world and identify Asia as the place uh, they want to be, the most bountiful growth opportunity, development opportunity, and often uh, where there's still some demographic wins. Mm -hmm. You know the global trade protection is rising. How will this influence the global economy? It's troubling that the rise in global trade protectionism, there's no question that uh, the the global economy has been more prosperous because of trade liberalization and openness. It it does seem, unfortunately, uh, the global economy has passed its most liberal phase from a a trade uh, perspective and protectionism has been creeping back in. Uh, Friendshoring has been creeping back in. Reshoring has been creeping back in. The IMF has done some detailed work on this and they're their assessment is uh, a bit troubling. Um, If the global economy uh, retreats back to levels of openness that we saw in the year 2000, uh, it could cost as much as 4.5% from the level of global GDP. So I I think we need to keep talking about the benefits of a free and open trading system. It's been important to developing uh, the Asian region um, and it's important to improving living standards uh, everywhere. Um, unfortunately, of course, at the moment, it seems like there's, there is some push uh, the other way. I think we should have more cooperations in the future to boost global economy. Well, global liberal trade liberalization occurred in an environment where there was large agreement at multilateral uh, organizations around tariff reduction, around um, trade liberalization, support of the World Trade Organization, For instance, unfortunately, at those institutions, there's a lot of disagreement about the best way uh, 
um, to move forward. As an economist, I hope that we find uh, more appropriate avenues for uh, cooperation and reaching agreement um, around trade because, of course, it's not just the rules around trade which can uh, uh, cause some friction, but also uh, if businesses worry that the rules may be changed uh, arbitrarily uh, or frequently, um, it reduces their confidence and they'll tend to invest at home uh, rather than invest outside. And it's the investing outside which also brings the world closer together. So, Richard, as we are near the end of 2024, would you like to brief global economy? Oh, 2025, I think, will be a pretty solid year for global growth. Interest rates um, are coming down, which will uh, ensure that the recovery we've had out of the, the pandemic and the tightening uh, out of the pandemic will continue um, to sustain itself. The main challenges and the things I'm worried about is uh, a lot of government demands on the economy a across a number of economies. Uh, 2024 has been the year of elections, uh, both in Asia and globally. And as new governments come in, typically they're trying to do more rather than uh, less. Uh, they're trying to improve equality, build more housing, deliver a more climate transition. And I think all of that is likely to cause uh, still uh, some commodity market challenges. And the commodity markets themselves also subject to the climate uh, transition. Accessing new deposits has become uh, more difficult and, and more onerous. And of course, different commodities will be required um, as we move through the transition than perhaps uh, the world used to consume uh, previously. But next year, I think, will be a very solid year for the global economy. Okay, thank you, Richard. That's all for our show. Thank you. Thank you.